In terms of the uh, food drive for Haiti, the youth groups that Wood Avenue and Sherrod are working on that. There are a couple of copies on uh, Aquila's desk out front of items that they are collecting. If you would like to uh, help with that, uh, they tell you what they would want, what size ships well and such. Do pray for Ryan. He's on quite an adventure. Sictive Car is in the Komi region of Russia, northern European Russia, just on this side of the Ural Mountains. From there, you go to Upta, Inta, Pechora, Vorgata, and then it's your, the North Pole. Uh, there are two trees between you and Santa Claus when you're in Sictive mm -hmm. Car. And so he'll have a chilling experience in more than one way. If he flies Aeroflot, Russian pilots fly like teenagers drive. You only use the first little part of the runway to take off. And when you stop, you stick the landing. So it's an interesting business. If he takes the train, it's 24 hours on a rail line that Stalin built on the bones of his own people in large measure. So if you hear a Russian tell you the story, Brad, about the building of that railway, it's fascinating and makes history all the more alive. When it comes to Theological Library Month, I wouldn't know there was a Theological Library Month except our librarian knew. Librarians know these kind of things, and they tell you about it. And then you hook up with the chapel man, and he says, okay, we'll do this. We'll bring a display up and put some of the older books and representative samples there for people to kind of look and be intrigued, but we'll talk. Well, I'll talk. And if you're getting a, a weird lesson on a weird subject, you may as well enjoy it. So I kind of like what we're talking about today. I want to start by telling you that there are many weaknesses with theological libraries. And these weaknesses are terrible things. They absolutely cannot cause you to learn by osmosis. Unless you go and read and engage, you won't gain a thing from those libraries. They can't reach out and touch you, even though they're in walking distance and there's snacks by the front door. Even a theological library cannot bless people who already know it. So if you already know everything, uh, don't bother because it'll just confuse you to go in there and hear stuff that is not what you've always been taught. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. The fear of the Lord, respect for God is the beginning of wisdom. And we're always going to have boatloads of stuff that we don't even know we don't know until we investigate and listen and choose to learn. This business of weakness of theological libraries is sort of famous. Uh, even a theological library can't bless people who don't enjoy learning. If you decide in advance, a library is an old, dusty place full of old, dusty people and old, dusty books, you'll be right every time. You'll not only be bored when you go, but you'll find the dust. On the other hand, if you were to think a theological library is a treasure of wisdom of the ages, and cool and interesting stuff, uh, you'll also be right about that every time because you'll find those treasures if you choose to go. Even a theological library can't bless us if we don't expect work, if we don't expect labor on our part in the learning process. I like the Bereans, uh, more noble than the ones in Thessalonica. They received the word with readiness of mind and search the scriptures daily, whether those things were so. If we search, we find, and if we don't search, things seldom tend to find us. Theological libraries are not only weak places, uh, they're dangerous places. They will mess with your head if you let them. So you may want to think about it and, and be cautious. If you visit a theological library and actually read, you'll find some of the stuff you know isn't so. And that is way disturbing to some people. I keep collecting examples of this because they sort of apply to me often. For example, you may have been taught most of your life, what we really need is a word for word translation of every Hebrew word and every Greek word and every other word that God ever inspired and that we wouldn't have any theological arguments, religious divisions, or problems anymore if we just go word for word. 
You visit a theological library and you'll find out language doesn't work that way. And that's not a weakness of God. That's not a weakness of inspiration. That's not a denial that a translation should be conservative and safe and respectful and proper. It just doesn't work word for word. You think about things we know and have been taught by people who are dear to us. And some of those things just aren't true. Have you heard the famous sermon that talks about the Greek words for love? And agape, agapeo at the pinnacle speaks of God's love. Wonderful thing. Only speaks of good and great and divine and holy. And a word like agape, agapeo, cognates, forms of that word would never be used of something mundane and ordinary. And then you read 1 John 2, 15, love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. And it's an agapeo word. Or you go to 1 Peter, excuse me, 2 Peter 2 in verse 15, description of the Old Testament villain, Balaam, who loved the wages of unrighteousness. And it's an agapeo word. You wouldn't even need your theological library for that if you just did Young's analytical concordance, you kind of discover. But you might need your theological library to discover 2 Samuel 13 and verse 1. You remember that garbage, incest, terrible situation with Amnon and Tamar? When the Septuagint says Amnon loved Tamar, it's a form of agapeo and kind of missing. The deal with agape and acapeo, it's defined by God's action in sending Jesus Christ and Jesus' action in dying on the cross for us. It's not the word itself. It's the narrative, the truth behind that word as used in the New Testament that's so beautiful, so powerful, and so strong. You visit a theological library, you may be disappointed to learn we don't have all the ancient writings. And all the ancient writings that we do have are not part of Scripture. And then all of a sudden you're with Dr. Gallagher and you're thinking about canonicity and you're thinking about the veracity of Scripture. And you're once again exploring. Maybe you don't even need a theological library quite for that because... You remember 1 Corinthians 4.16 mentions the first epistle I wrote to you? And that's 1 Corinthians we're reading it from. So 1 Corinthians isn't 1 Corinthians. And if you visit your theological library, you'll find people who've made all kinds of proposals. Maybe part of 1 Corinthians is 1 Corinthians. I don't much think so. Maybe 2 Corinthians is 1 Corinthians and we got our labeling wrong. That doesn't work out too well. The real deal is Paul wrote more letters than we know about and we have the ones God wants us to have. Or you think about Colossians 4, 16. The interesting thing in Colossians 4 and 16 is you're supposed to read the letter to the Laodiceans and I don't find the first Laodiceans. So whether it's Colossians 4 or 1 Corinthians 5, 9, challenging things when you visit a the theological library, it can be dangerous to us. You know, there are other words that we have time and trouble with. Some of us were blessed recently to be in the preacher's luncheon when Dr. Gallagher talked about ecclesia. And the fact that the New Testament word ecclesia means assembly. And that we're not real wise when we try to take the ek off and break it out into the called out. Sounds cool. To be honest with you, that works just as well as pineapple. Uh, as you all know, a pineapple is a hybrid between a pine tree and an apple tree. And it has many of those characters. You know it doesn't work that way. You visit your theological library and you'll find out that language changes over time. I'm a uh, boring person in more ways than you know. But during the Christmas season, I will wear my Grinch tie and I will wear my humbug hat. Because I believe in homebook. In the words of the famous song, I will don now my gay apparel. I've never been gay. Never will be gay. But I don't mind being a little Christmas festive from time to time. 
language changes. Visit your theological library. And if you read it from the translation I pick out for you, what is it, James 5 and verse 11? The Lord is very pitiful. Don't preach that on Sunday. Do not stand up in front of your congregation and say, we serve a pitiful God. Don't challenge the brethren in the spirit of 1 Peter 3 and verse 8. You know you're pitiful too. And you should be pitiful because 1 Peter 3 8 calls you to be pitiful used to mean full of pity. And if you read it in a more modern translation or you visit your theological library, you'll be reminded that compassionate is a pretty cool word there. Be compassionate. Love that. Our Lord is compassionate and full of mercy. And that's just as cool as it can be. Theological library is a dangerous place. I'm not Harvard, Cambridge, or Oxford educated. Never will be. But I love reading articles by some who are. Especially the ones where I find glaring logical errors. Or great assumptions that are made and never stated. Now admittedly, people educated at that level make way fewer scholarly mistakes than I would make. But when they do make them, they stick out like sore thumb and it's kind of fun to find those things. It's amazing to me. I've given an assignment, especially in graduate course, but even undergraduate this time, uh, your fellow student, Michael Paisley, has done such a beautiful job with some article reviews I was reading yesterday. He read those reviews from scholarly people in refereed journals. Now, he didn't actually visit your theological library. He read them online through resources available through your theological library. Identified internal inconsistencies. Found scholarly people who were not paying attention to the text, but were asserting opinions and judgments like they came from the text. I love it when our students think. I love it when you read with your brain engaged and trust the fact that God has given you good judgment and just because a famous person wrote it in a famous book or posted it online doesn't make it so. You think about it. Theological library is a dangerous place because there's no end of stuff to learn. You're learning more and more about less and less. Focus it. I have an old guy Bible because I'm an old guy. It has big print. In my old guy big print Bible, the book of Ruth, a little less than five pages. I was visiting our theological library recently and one of the newest books, the structure of the book of Ruth, it has smaller print than my old guy Bible. And that book on the structure of the five page book of Ruth, 288 pages. Now I am impressed. Uh, I haven't read it yet, but somebody knows way more about Ruth than I've ever dreamed of knowing. They may know more about Ruth than the Lord knows about Ruth. And that's a dangerous thing if that's the case. But theological libraries can be dangerous places. You visit theological library and you get a new orientation toward books and, and learning. You know, we appreciate Ecclesiastes 12, 12 of making many books. There is no end and much study is wearisome to the flesh. You ask any good librarian, especially somebody who deals with theological issues. Do you really need all these books? Well, it'll give you a yes and then a pause. And I always like what comes after the pause. Yeah, I really need all these books and all the other ones too. They always just want one more until they get to everything. Let me uh, advise you, uh, stay out of libraries, especially theological libraries, because they'll mess with you. If you don't ignore your library, you'll learn a bunch of things other people don't know. 
And what you learn will make you enjoy learning. And then you'll become one of those diseased people, a, a lifelong learner. Yes. And somebody who learns lifelong is just going to have a more interesting life and a fuller ministry. Uh, need to stay out of theological libraries because if you don't stay out of those places, you'll make some friendships with some really odd people. And you've been on the Heritage Campus long enough to know we do odd well. We, we've got that covered. And if you make odd friendships with odd people, you'll wind up on an airplane to Russia. <laughs> you'll wind up in the Philippines teaching. You'll be in Haiti doing mission work. You'll be serving in Myanmar and wondering whether to call it that or Burma. Uh, Burma spells easier. I, I like that. Uh, stay out of theological libraries. Because if you hang out there much and you read much, you'll discover this book is more beautifully crafted, richer, more challenging, smarter, more helpful than you ever dreamed. And when I say that, I'm not insulting you. I know you have high respect for the Bible already, but the more you read about it, the more you'll appreciate the nuances, the challenges, the, the psychology, the communication skills, the theology, it, it'll get you. And once it gets you, it'll meddle with you. It'll make you think, uh, cause you to grow, and change you from the inside out. Faith still comes by hearing the Word of God. Stay out of the theological library. There's a warning, and I love that warning from 2 Timothy 3 and verse 7. It speaks about some people who didn't live what they knew of God's truth. And it says of them they are ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. Sad situation. If you visit and actually use theological library, with proper respect for God's word, knowing that it all goes back to God's word as the fountain and the source and always we judge everything by the truth of God's word, you're going to be the very opposite of 2 Timothy 3.7. You're going to be always learning and ever grasping more and more of God's truth. One of the saddest things anybody's ever said to me many years ago, we were talking about education and libraries and degrees and such like. I don't need another degree. I already know more than I can do. Oh my. I too sometimes know more than I can do, but only sometimes. And the more I learn, especially the more I learn from God, the better I do what I do. And the better my heart is as I do it. I hope you're not here for a piece of paper. I, I love diplomas. I I'm fine with hanging them on the wall and celebrating that. I want you to complete your degree big time, more than you even know. Don't go for the piece of paper. Go for the learning. Go for the knowledge. Uh, go for the heart. If it really is sharper than a two-edged sword, if it really is discerning, if it really is active and life-changing, what an opportunity. What a blessing. Tell your local theological librarian you attended chapel today and you're confused. The guy talked in chapel today and he said, theological libraries have many weaknesses. They are very dangerous. I should avoid them. And see what she tells you. Thank you much.